Hello and welcome back. Eddie Radosevich, George Stoy here from the Soonerscoop.com studios. Josh McQuishan down in Houston from Soonerscoop HQ. Uh, we'll be wrapping up a little bit of the uh, Houston Under Armour camp. Obviously, we're going to hit on a couple of uh, Oklahoma commitments, or I guess one commitment in Kevin Sperry, as well as a decommitment in Jaden Nickens. But uh, really good Sunday camp. If you want to see any of the interviews that Josh did with uh, some of the, uh, obviously, Jonathan Hatton, Oklahoma running back commit in the uh, 2026 class, as well as a number of 2025 guys, uh, you can check that out on the Suter Scoop editorial page. Just coming back from a Porter Moser press conference on Tuesday afternoon as a little bit of fallout from Oklahoma's, uh, I guess, not failed attempt, but getting left out of the NCAA I mean, tournament. It was a failed attempt. It was a failed attempt at getting into the NCAA tournament. Yeah. That, that's probably fine. A passionate uh, speech from uh, Porter Moser on Tuesday afternoon. Bob Bill and I did an instant reaction, which you can find on the Soonerscoop.com YouTube page right here. But Josh, welcome back in. A really good camp. Let's start, though, with Kevin Sperry, something that uh, you did some reporting on all the way back last week as Kevin Sperry's reign in Oklahoma is over. He got it. He got his 5A state championship. He's headed back down south, down I-35, familiar territory as uh, the 2025 quarterback commit currently for the Oklahoma uh, program, Kevin Sperry, headed from Carl Laubert in Midwest City, Oklahoma, down to uh, familiar territory in Denton Geyer, the former school of Jackson Arnold. Yeah, you know, and th there's a lot of – Geyer will start from that side. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, we like you mentioned, Jackson Arnold – uh, and going back to like J.W. Walsh, I mean, Geyer just has a really good history of quarterback production. Sure. Just year every year, they tend to turn out guys. And Kevin Sperry will be the next one in line in all likelihood. I mean, I know they've got a, a senior returning that had some injuries and slowed him down. But, I mean, it, it shouldn't be. Uh, th it's kind of like, you know, he walked into a situation at Carl Albert where they had a returning starter with state title rings. And, you know, it didn't slow Kevin Sperry down too much. I don't think this will either. Um, and it's an offense that Oklahoma has a lot of similarity with and a lot of familiar uh, familiarity with. So I think that will make that, you know, a little easier. And I think at the end of the day, guys, it was something that we talked about as far as the Carl Albert side of things. When he went there, Kevin Sperry was never going to put up huge numbers at Carl Albert. He was never going to be, you know, a guy throwing for 4,000 yards in his high school senior year or anything like that. And I, I think there was some desire for him to get to showcase his ability a little bit. And beyond that, I also know, you know, and I reported on this earlier in the week, his mother never actually moved to Oklahoma City. That just never kind of played out the way they had originally intended. So she'd been commuting back and forth this whole, you know, six, seven months now um, between Oklahoma City and Dallas. And she obviously works in Dallas. So I think this was just a convenient way to get the entire family kind of back under one roof. And obviously do so at, at one of the best programs in the Dallas Metroplex. Josh, I think most people are going to react to this and say, well, okay, what does this mean for OU's recruitment of him? Um, I know that we've talked about it since Jeff Lebby's left. I mean, what, what is what does this mean for uh, his recruitment going forward? Yeah, it, it's really interesting because, you know, last week when the Jaden Nick and stuff happened, and I know we'll get into that here in a little bit, but um, when that happened, it kind of puts you on alert. Like, okay, there's some things out there. There's some loose ends that I want to check around on. And Kevin Sperry, like whatever he's done, I don't know that he's really come out and unequivocally said like, I'm in, there's no doubt. I, you know, I know he talked after the state title game and that put a lot of things to rest, but it just hasn't been quite the same fervor, quite the same volume that we saw from the guy that showed up at all five days of camp, which we talked a lot about, you know, in the, uh, in the summer. So it has just felt a little different and talking to some people, I know some schools like, you know, old miss Texas A&M, a few others have kind of sniffed around, you know, just kind of seeing if there's anything going on, obviously him moving back to Dallas. I think schools are going to kick the tires just to kind of see like, is there something wrong here was that you know is this you know going back closer to mom is that a cover story you know and that that's just guys doing their due diligence but at the same time even if Sperry wanted to look around I think there's an inherent problem in that most of the primetime schools that you would say are at least a lateral move from Oklahoma they've got their guys already guys we know quarterback recruiting happens really early so I don't know that there's going to be a lot of options he's going to like that are going to have a spot available to him and the places that maybe he, you know, that, that do have a spot, 
they've got a guy they've been recruiting for six, seven months that they've developed a relationship with that they're probably going to see through, you know, however that plays out. Now, maybe somebody ends up needing a guy late and Kevin Sperry can get involved there if he wants to. But uh, again, it, it's tough to see the math working out on this, um, even if other schools and even if Sperry himself wanted to look around a little bit. Do you think, too, that maybe because you haven't, as, as you kind of speculated there, because he hasn't come out and just unequivocally said, I'm not going anywhere, I'm Oklahoma. I wonder if there's just a familiarity within Oklahoma and the coaching staff and everybody that is here that maybe they don't feel like he needs to make that type of statement because he has been solid over the course of the last you know year or so since he uh, made the commitment. Sure, and, and I think a lot of it, you know, if, if there's any – any reason for some concern or some doubt that they might have, I think it would be connected to, you know, and, and this isn't like breaking uh, breaking news, but obviously the change at offensive coordinator from Seth Luttrell and Jeff Levy, oh, yeah. just talking to people. They have a different way of managing these things. Like Jeff Levy is very much a guy that is kind of of, you know, that new age. Like he's going to hold your hand and he's going to do what you need to do. And that's, you know, not – trying to make that sound like, oh, Jeff Levy's a coddler or anything like that. Just like he comes from a little different era where we're going to do whatever it is we need to do to get you to sign. Like that, that, That's kind of his methodology. Seth Luttrell is not an old guy, but he has a little different mentality of, okay, you're in the boat. You say you're in the boat. Let's move forward. Like, let's do the things that we need to do. We want to have you as ready as we can when you enroll in December. But I don't know that he's going to do all the little things that Jeff Levy is willing to do or you know, was willing to do. So that's kind of the, the question for me is if everybody can kind of be on the same page and be okay that this recruitment's going to be a little different under Seth Luttrell than it was under Jeff Levy. Just to piggyback on that a little bit, and you hit on this on the Crimson Corner, and it is kind of interesting just because Brent has been so outspoken about guys that move from high school to high school. How have uh, those within the program uh, that you have talked to, or I guess that we have, uh, you know, been able to contact, just in terms of the move from Carl Albert to Denton Geyer? This is his third high school in three years. Uh, is that any cause for concern, or is this something that is almost a uh, a product of circumstance, and it's going to be a lot easier on the family uh, to, you know, be a a nuclear you know, unit there, uh, just with everybody in kind of under the same household. You know, as much a family guy as Brent is, like I can understand that he would be like, okay, right. I, I can get that. I, I can understand where that's coming from. At the same time, I can tell you, speaking to a Carl Albert source last week, that not long ago he had several, and, and it, I, I think I'm correct in saying that he had the Carl Albert contingent in his office or something. They were all together, and he was talking to them about, and, you know, uh, it may not have been a pointed conversation, but somewhere in one of Brent Venable's speeches, he got back to, like you said, a talking point of his, that these transient guys in high school tend to end up as transient guys in college. And I know Kevin Sperry was in the room. So like, that's kind of a, and of course, at the time he knew nothing about this move. This all happened. You know, we talked about it uh, in, in the report I put up. This all happened very quickly from, you know, a perspective of who outside the family knew what was going on. So uh, th this wasn't Brent trying to aim something at Kevin Sperry or anything like that, because, you know, as well as Kevin Sperry in that group, Marcus James had left from McGinnis to go to Carl Albert. So sure. this, this wasn't a singular uh, uh, thing. So again, do I think that's a deal breaker? Because in some cases, maybe in this one, because Kevin Sperry is both a quarterback, both been a, a, as well as being a longtime commitment. I think Oklahoma can kind of say, you know, we we feel okay about this one, but this is obviously not something they want all their guys to do by any stretch. A little bit different in terms of uh, maybe some other guys and certainly somebody that is uh, now no longer a part of the Oklahoma class. Jaden Nickens, the Oklahoma City Millwood slash Oklahoma City Douglas, spent two semesters or you know each semester at a different school, played football for Millwood won a state basketball championship for Douglas. Uh, he decided to decommit from the Oklahoma 2025 class. Uh, how surprising was it? 
I know that there's a lot of talk that's going to be put out there as far as Jaden Nickens' basketball future. I remember all the way back to his commitment ceremony and how much uh, he talked about basketball being kind of his first love, wanted to uh, see if he could play both, how unusual that is playing uh, football and basketball, given that they're during the same semester at college. Just kind of your read on Oklahoma and uh, maybe their continued pursuit of Jaden Nickens, who was uh, no longer part of the class. Yeah, I, I first off, I don't think this was any surprise to Oklahoma. I think this is something that, you know, just to put it very bluntly, I think Oklahoma is comfortable with this decision. I, I And not that there is any bad blood or anything like that. I think Jaden Nickens has a very big focus on basketball. And Eddie, you know, you mentioned the move to Douglas. It, it wasn't that long ago that that would have been, at worst, a lateral move in football sure. to maybe a better one moving up against a higher competition. Douglas, I, I didn't realize how bad Douglas has been over the last five or six years. Yeah. Like I went looking, and I think they've won three games the last six years or something. I mean, just something unbelievable like that. And I, I, you know, I remember when Douglas was competing for state championships. Shout out DeAndre so Clark. So it's, it's – yeah, yeah, and, and our you know our guy Willis Alexander, the whole the whole yeah. thing, you know, it's just a very different world. Um, but no, it, it is. Um, I, I think, and I think that move kind of was a tip off to Oklahoma, like all this stuff he's saying about basketball, like you mentioned, Eddie, at the press conference when he announced his commitment. That's not lip service. Like he really is going to do that. And guys, we've seen lots of OU players succeed with baseball and football basketball and football that's a really hard thing to do because there's so much overlap in the season and it's you're doing such different things with your body like that that can be tough to maintain you know you spend all summer trying to build up your body in football and then you run and run and run to death in basketball come the winter that's you know like the gains you make almost seem lost so and beyond that I you know, Eddie, you were just with the guy that could probably answer this better than I can. I don't know that Oklahoma basketball was all that interested in Jaden Nixon. Sure. So, I, you know, I think that is the other side of this coin, that if you want to do that, you're going to have to find a place that believes in, you know, in your ability and your, you know, chance to help that program and do so while juggling all this football stuff. So, like I said, that that's going to be – um, the thing he has to answer. But again, I don't think Oklahoma was surprised. I don't think Oklahoma is going to remain involved. Um, but the nice thing is we talked about it, you know, when these commitments started rolling in, Oklahoma had all these 2025 wide receiver options. They're still there. I mean, there's still plenty of good ones. So I think it's something Oklahoma can more move forward from and, and be completely fine. Josh, I was just about to say, Emmett Jones has done a really good job um, you know, his, his one year now at Oklahoma uh, recruiting receivers. Who Who's next on that list? I know you saw da uh, Andrew Marsh down in uh, Houston this past weekend, but who are some other guys that oh, you could target at wide receiver? Yeah, you know, I, I think there is a group of maybe six or seven that are plausible, but I, I guess if I'm just handicapping the chances of what I think is most reasonable – Emmanuel Choice, the wide receiver from Lancaster that Eddie and I saw the week before in Dallas at Under Armour, big-bodied guy, would be kind of different. I'm trying to think of somebody on the roster. I'm sure there's somebody that slipped in my mind. But I guess uh, um, Jaden Gibson, kind of in that ballpark, like a big-bodied, you know, and now he's probably broader than Jaden is, but that same long arm, long-legged, very, very vertical, you know, kind of wants to win over the top type of receiver. That's a manual choice. Um, Andrew Marsh, like you mentioned, he was a – and we'll get into it. He he was a robot this weekend. Um, and then, you know, the two others that I would kind of watch, uh, one is Caleb Cunningham, the, you know, kind of fringy five-star from Mississippi that took a visit to Oklahoma earlier this spring. I You know, I, I think that's a guy Oklahoma really wants to make a run at. At the same time, I don't know – that I believe that the odds are all that good just because I know Jeff Levy from everything I've heard is absolutely pouring everything into that. And that, that is a guy they really want to focus on. The last would be Quincy Porter from New Jersey who took a visit, uh, the same, the future freaks weekend. I love him on tape. Uh, Jersey is always tough to kind of, some guys are just like, well, they're going to go to Penn state or they're going to go, you know, somewhere like that, maybe Ohio state. And then some guys really want to get out. You know, Logan Howland is a good example. Uh, Oklahoma's got a guy named Cole Bryler coming in um, in uh, June for an official visit. So they are starting to build some inroads there in Jersey. And 
Uh, again, I expect you know uh, Quincy Porter to be back for an official visit. So those are the four I would focus on. But you've got guys like Cooper Perry. You've got a few others out there that are still possible as well. I was wondering too about you know somebody like a Jaden Nickens that he's coming off of the state basketball championship. Uh, you know, certainly played a big role in uh, Douglas being able to do that. How much do you get wrapped up into just the seasonal type thing? And then when football comes around and you start participating in seven on seven and all of a sudden, oh, football is my favorite sport as opposed to basketball. I just always wonder, especially uh, talking to some of these, uh, you know, dual sport, triple sport guys. Uh, it always seems like the sport that they're in is their favorite sport if you were to ask them. And then they take the big picture look and, you know, it ends up being some other sport. But it be certainly interesting to uh, track. Let's get into a little bit of the Under Armour Houston event. We wrapped up everything from the Dallas event last week here on the Recruiting Report, Josh. But you were down there on uh, Sunday. Really good camp. As I said, you can watch all five of the interviews that you did with some of the guys that we're going to talk about on the Soonerscoop.com editorial YouTube page. Uh, let's start with Jonah Williams. Obviously, there's a, a strong presence with Oklahoma, a strong recruitment, a hell of a football player. And uh, I don't know if anybody saw the social media stuff over the weekend, an exceptional baseball player as well. Yeah, that was really the topic kind of at hand with a lot of people. And I guess maybe because he is in the middle of his baseball season at, at Galveston Ball. And, uh, you know, talking to Jonah, he is – for a guy that's, you know, juggling all this recruiting attention, he's juggling baseball. He's trying to figure out, you know, not, and again, not like, you know, James Nesta and Taylor Tatum where, okay, baseball is going to be a part of my college future. He's having to gauge baseball with both college and major league, very real opportunities for him. Um, so I, I think that is one of those interesting things that you'll just never, you know, that we're, we don't know where that's going to play, but there was some talk that, you know, that Jonah told, um, uh, Mike Roach of 24 seven that I want to make sure he gets his credit that um, he was, I, I guess I don't want to go too far because I wasn't there when the quote was said, but it sounded like very seriously considering if he was a first round pick that he would go and, you know, take that opportunity to make some money in the NFL. So that may, you know, have very, uh, a few different avenues of what that means. But as far as Oklahoma and what we can know now, I'll kind of pivot back to what, what we should be talking about. I think Oklahoma's in great shape. He did nothing to hide that. He talked about taking four official visits in June. None of them are actually going to be to Oklahoma, which was a little surprising. But then I said, well, do you think Oklahoma gets one eventually? And he goes, yeah, I'll probably visit them during the season, which to me, that means you haven't decided yet. You're not planning to decide in the summer. And you're going to decide later on, and Oklahoma's going to be one of the last schools that has an opportunity to bring you on campus. So I, I took what I heard from him is still very positive for OU. Certainly good news. And, you know, it, it's kind of lent to the discussion that we've had. Uh, we had it right before we started uh, taping today, just in terms of Oklahoma, are they going to take three safeties in that 2025 class? And maybe that decision's made a little bit easier if that is an actuality and a reality that Jonah Williams could be a first round draft pick in the major league baseball. Absolutely. I mean, cause you know, I've got, I've got a prediction for him and he and I kind of joked about that <laughs> the, the other day. I think he has uh, forgiven me for that. I don't know that he loved it at the time, but I think he's kind of passed it now. Um, and then, you know, I've also got predictions in for Amari and Robinson and Marcus Wimberly, uh, you know, uh, Wimberly, we saw the week before in Dallas at Under Armour and sure. All three seem to be getting the full court press from Oklahoma. And I know a lot of people have asked me, well, Josh, how does, you know, how does that going to work? And I, I think, you know, it, it's something I hear a lot in um, a couple of podcasts I listen to, but it's one I really like. And it's the old, you know, Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park. Life finds a way, you know, like, how do you work? These numbers work. Life finds a way. And that's kind of what I think you're going to see here. Whether Oklahoma doesn't get one of these guys or whether Jonah Williams goes to the major leagues or, you know, one of the guys on the roster leaves early, you know, whatever it may be, there's there's just three players they like a lot and they think can add to not only the roster but the room. And I, I think they're just going to move forward and however it plays out, you know, it'll, it'll work itself out. Brandon Hall, excellent recruiter, um, clearly yeah. at safety. Josh, just real quickly, you mentioned four visits at June. What are some of the other schools that are, are going after Jonah Williams right now? Who, who are some of the top contenders? The You know, there I'm trying to remember exactly what he listed. I want to say 
Texas, Texas is one of them. Texas A&M, I believe, was one. Um, I, Oregon was the third. And I almost want to say like Tennessee. Like there was kind of a random fourth, if I remember correctly. Um, but I, I could be, I could absolutely be flip flopping him and uh, Andrew Marsh a little bit there. But um, I know that those three, Texas A&M and Oregon, were involved. Um, I, from when you talk to people, I think Oregon is the school you have to keep an eye on. This could absolutely be another Peyton Bowen scenario where it comes down to signing day and the two schools, you know, both think they're in good shape, you know, wh- whatever. Um, but that's kind of what it feels like because my impression is that both Texas and A&M both believe in, um, you know, they, they want, they're telling him, okay, you'll get a shot at safety. I don't know. And again, this is me reading into it. This is nothing from Jonah. This, my impression is that he's not sure that's real. Like, I, I think, yeah, they're going to tell me safety, but about practice two, I'm going to end up playing linebacker. And I just, I don't think, A, I don't think that's tailored to his game. And B, he doesn't want to do that. That's that's not how he sees himself. And the one thing I'll say is, I know OU fans will hear Oregon and say, oh, NIL, it's all over. Oregon doesn't have a baseball program like Skip Johnson, who just went sure. and swept TCU this weekend. So, that's a big part of it. And he talked about being around all the baseball staffs and getting to know those guys. So I, this could be another one, a lot like Taylor Tatum, where the baseball program could get a win for Oklahoma. Not to mention James Nesta, not to mention, uh, you know, obviously Kyler Murray and kind of the foundation of whatever things that they've done. We talked about it kind of ad nauseum, just as far as the way that uh, Skip Johnson, as well as Brent Vittables work together in the recruitment. Ryan Gaines plays a big role in that as well. Player, uh, director of player development over there at the baseball program. Oklahoma 2026 running back Jonathan Hatton. I was blown away by uh, just the sheer size of uh, this young man out of San Antonio Sabalo Steel. He's one of those guys that you have to remind yourself, like you go to talk to him, you're like, holy cow, this dude's a beast. And again, this is a kid, I, I think I mentioned on last week's recruiting report, this is a guy telling me he's hoping to run 10 six and track this year. I mean, look at that size. Like that's a it's massive stupid. human being that has a lot of speed. How yeah. tall is he? And this is th- this, uh, he's six, one, six, one and a half, he's two, tall. maybe. I mean, he's a big, long kid. Um, and then I go talk to him and he's this soft spoken kid with braces and you're like, okay, all right. So like, you have to remind yourself that like, even though he's kind of a physical Marvel, he is still so young, still figuring it out. And you know, uh, this clip of him catching the ball earlier, that's something you don't get to see him do a lot at Steel. Steel is a lot like Carl Albert and that they're going to build themselves off the running game. And now they've got plenty of athletes. You know, they've got two receivers, including Royal Capel that Oklahoma's in on, um, that are division one power five type players, but they are, they're going to make their living running the ball, whether it's quarterback run, whether, you know, they, they do a lot of stuff. Um, where they just want to grind on you and kind of wear you out because generally they have bigger and better athletes than you do. So uh, it was kind of interesting to see him catch the ball. That looked really natural. He had a few more um, where I kind of caught the the end of it and I didn't get the full re- clip or whatever. So um, I, I was I was impressed. I, I thought that he kind of answered that question that was just kind of an unknown. RBLB is the toughest position drill to uh, get because you get so many of the like say you have five clips three of them normally are going to be incomplete passes and if you yes. don't get two of them you're kind of best out of luck go ahead George I, I was just going to say just for comparison I, I did a quick search Joe Mixon 6'1 220 uh, Jonathan Hatton 6'1 203 right now listed so uh, just for comparison sake that's sure. that's insane I mean I, I don't know Josh if that's a good comparison I, I haven't watched a ton of Jonathan's tape, but mm-hmm. just looking at body size on film there, it looked like he's just a big dude, kind of like Mixon. Yeah, I, I would say body type. That's actually a pretty good comparison, George. Like they they really kind of long arm, long legged, high cut guys. Um, now, obviously, I didn't see Joe until late in his senior year when Eddie and yeah. I met him. At, or I mean, Eddie had seen him before I had, but I didn't get the chance to see him until the Army game his senior year. So, um, a little bit of a different comparison, but as far as, you know, you kind of walk it back and say, okay, I bet this is what Joe looked like as a, as a, you know, rising junior. I I would say that's probably pretty comparable, honestly. Still without a doubt, maybe one of the single best performances just over the course of a single day at the Under Armour five-star event at Soldier Field 
uh, with Joe Mixon. I, it's still like I remember it to this day. It's kind of like seeing Doriel Green Beckham uh, or meeting Bryce Youngquist. It did happen. As far as let's stay running back real quick. Tory Blaylock was another guy that was down there that you were able to check out on uh, Sunday in Houston. What did you think about his performance on top of uh, you know kind of what you guys were able to talk about after his uh, camp with Oklahoma or uh, camp down in Houston? Interest in Oklahoma, obviously the son of a uh, former NFL running back as well. Yeah, you know his father Derek Blaylock played with the Chiefs and I believe maybe the Vikings. I feel like there was one or two other teams in there. Yeah, I think there were three um, total. I but, ended up looking it up. Okay. And I, I, I always remember him as a chief, I think with Priest Holmes, I think in that era, if I remember correctly. Um, but anyway, with um, with Tory, very, very different type of runner, where Hatton is a guy that even with his size, he's going to move laterally a little bit, got great feet. Tory Blaylock wants to stick his foot in the ground and get north and south, like kind of reminds you of um, like a Tatum Bell type of player from Oklahoma State yep. years ago that had a lot of speed kind of tall, kind of upright as a runner. Um, but it, again, I, I want to see him continue to improve on that lateral movement and being more explosive in and out of his cuts, but th there's plenty to like. I mean, like I said, if he is, if he's in your secondary, it's over. He, you're, you're not running with him. That's a kid that's been training to basically be a sprinter since he was a kid. And you get some of that sprinter stuff where like I'm saying, He's got to still work on some of the lateral ability and that kind of thing. Um, but, I, again, I liked him as a receiver. I see plenty of ability in his game. Um, you know, and as far as what we talked about, you know, we can get into a little bit some of the specifics of it that I've, you know, kind of already talked with you guys about. But the one thing I thought was interesting is he has one official visit set up, and it's to Oklahoma, and he doesn't really seem to know of much else that he's got planned. It's interesting too, Josh, because there's a lot going on with uh, DeMarco Murray. And, and for those that aren't aware, there's been a report out there uh, that he is interviewing for the Ohio State running backs job. Um, we'll see what happens there. But DeMarco also, over the, I think over the weekend, uh, tweeted out the Yamaha uh, tweet, which is typically uh, in reference to somebody committing. Uh, any chance that that is Blaylock? I would say... There's a pretty good chance that that if if I was handicapping it, he would be my betting favorite at this point in time. Because, and I asked Tori, and I don't want to, you know, like because we were just talking before we went on camera. I don't want to say too much, but I he definitely didn't deny the possibility. I guess would be the best way to say it. Um, I didn't, and, and I, also to be clear, didn't say that it was him. Just kind of, you know, like oh, we'll see. You know, like it, it was very open ended, but the the lack of a denial, even really an attempt to do so, tells me that Oklahoma, whether it was him or not, is in really, really good shape with Tory Blaylock. And it's it's one of the reasons I've had a prediction in for him for, I think, a couple of months now. I think it also is a somewhat good indication that DeMarco Murray is... I was, I was getting ready to say, it, it doesn't seem like this Ohio State thing is very serious, or at least I'm not taking it very seriously right now. I don't know about you two. I, I, I personally am not. I mean, I think it could be one of those things where, look, he's currently the lowest paid offensive assistant OU has right now um, I, we know that he also interviewed for the Michigan job uh, which obviously um, went to the Ohio State running backs coach so I, I think this is just something that I would not be shocked at the next Board of Regents meeting DeMarco Murray has a little bit of a bump in pay oh I, I agree because guys I mean you, you talked about that Michigan interview they hired Tony Alford who I know people say oh Ohio State you know he lit there were a lot of people at Ohio State that weren't over the moon about Tony Alford and where he was and what he was doing in recruiting. So I I wonder a little bit if if maybe I I don't know if DeMarco had either told them no or you know they kind of got the the idea that that probably wasn't going to be the avenue they were going to go down or that they could go down. So again, I, I I'm with you all that I think this is probably a very savvy guy making sure everyone in Norman knows he is valued by obviously really elite programs elsewhere as well. No doubt. Let's stay on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, it, I mean, it, it seems like every time we see this guy, he's done something incredible, whether it be you going to see him in high school. Uh, and it sounds like the same was to be said on Sunday down at the Under Armour camp where he won MVP at the wide receiver position 2025 wide receiver offer Andrew Marsh. He just simply, I, he, he has to be one of the best wide receivers in the country. 
I I think so. And I, I was there actually. Uh, Cody Belair, Eddie, who you met last weekend, yeah. was was there in Houston you with heard me. What and, he had you know, to say and, about the OU fans. <laughs> uh, but Cody, we, we talked about you know kind of Andrew falling in our rankings a little bit, and I, and I think there was some question of kind of top end speed. How does he separate? How does he do some of those things? And I. Like you watch him and you kind of look at it through those lens and you kind of say, okay, like I, I, I can get where that's coming from. But the thing is, and, and I think Cody would probably echo this is when you watch that kid, even if he's in traffic, even if he hasn't separated from the corner, he has, I, I, I just don't know either way to say it, like CD lamb type ability to create that little cushion, that little space or to catch the ball at odd angles and then just turn up field and make plays. Like I, he has one of those rare gifts as a receiver, where even if there's not much space, he can find a little and he can work in it. And um, again, he's not a four-four guy. He's not going to run by everybody, um, but he's more than fast enough. I think it's one of those things where you can get too caught up in that sometimes. Um, but I, I was super impressed, and I think in in one of the things I put up about him, he's. He's like the bad guy in a movie when he lines up a receiver. Like, you know what's happening. You know it's coming, and there's not a thing you can do about it. And there were some really good corners that just you know, literally guys were just falling on the ground. They just couldn't keep up with him and some of his cuts and his route running. Who are some of the teams, Josh, going after him? I'm looking at his uh, RPM right now. Texas is in front, USC, LSU, Oklahoma. Uh, those are four pretty good schools when, it, when you think about the receivers that have come out of those schools. I mean, who's – Who's maybe uh, atop his, his recruitment right now? He, you know, George, I always say this. Like, if you give me six months out from signing day, just about any kid in the country, if you'll let me pick one of, like, three schools, he's going to go to one of those three. Like, Andrew is actually a little trickier. Like, I, I think he's a little more open to everything. He's taken it all in. He's never won to tip his hand very much. Like, he he's just kind of even keeled all the time. Like that's the thing that I think makes him more frustrating as a player, even for, um, for these corners. Andrew doesn't talk trash. He just like goes, runs his route. And he's like, good job. Like, it's almost like shaming you like, Hey, great effort, buddy. Like it's, and it's, you know, you can tell the guys like, shut up, man. Like, don't just like, leave me alone. Say something terrible so I can hate you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just kind of that deal. But, um, as a recruit, like I said, I, I think USC, he'll get back out to again. I think they'll get an official visit. Oklahoma's going to get an official visit. Texas will get an official visit. Um, those three, and then I think you could throw in, like I said, I, I'm trying to remember if he and Jonah Williams. Tennessee, I believe, is there. Uh, Michigan, I believe he mentioned. And he had a couple of random ones, like Louisville he was talking about taking a visit to. So there was a few in there that were a little harder to like, okay, that's that's not what I was expecting. Um, but there's no question. I mean, Oklahoma to me has as good a chance as just about anybody. He's got a great relationship with him at Jones. He's been up there a ton. Um, and he just talked about Oklahoma doesn't really pitch him on anything. They just make sure he knows what a priority he is. And I think that's a big deal to Andrew to know that even with, you know, Elijah Thomas committed, um, uh, you know, and who am I forgetting? Um, not Jaden Nickens, obviously, but they, they've got a second receiver. What's Grayson that? Harris. Yeah. Yeah. Grayson Harris. Yeah. So brutal. Sorry. Grayson. Another baseball. Player. Um, yeah. Yeah. And a good one as well. Um, but yeah, the, um, even with that, he knows like you're there, you're a guy that they feel they can build that offense around. Like you can be a big part of the puzzle real quick, Josh. Uh, we've now seen him in back-to-back -back weeks at the Under Armour camps compare and contrast just Elijah Thomas and what he brought, uh, winning MVP at the DFW stop. Uh, as opposed to Andrew Marsh, who won the MVP down in Houston over the weekend. I, Eddie, I was thinking about this because I, you know, I, I kind of threw out the CD thing last week with Elijah from a physical traits, like his mm -hmm. body type. Um, and then Andrew is more what CD could do almost inherently. Like he just had a natural feel when the ball was in the air. And that's, that's kind of what Andrew is. I, I think when you talk about it, I think Andrew's the better player right now. I think he's the guy that if you line him up against a college corner, he's more likely to win a rep than Elijah Thomas is right now. I think Elijah Thomas has more ceiling because I think that he has physical traits that I'm just not sure Andrew can match up to. He's 
he's bigger, he's broader, he's a little longer, which, and Andrew Marsh has got, you know, a lot of reach himself, but Elijah's just almost, un, you know, uh, he's not that kind of that 1% where he can make some catches that other people just can't. And I think as he refines his game, learns kind of the route running stuff, because Andrew, I'm sorry, Andrew Marsh has been working with guys since he was 12 years old sure. on route running and technique and how you set up a corner and how to go in with a plan and that kind of stuff. Elijah Thomas lives out in Eastern Oklahoma. I'm not saying he hadn't worked with people, but it's not the same. He hasn't had day in and day out wide receiver skill training. And I think once he gets under a guy like Emmett Jones, who we all know can teach the finer points, I think you're going to see him really grow rapidly. And Andrew Marsh has plenty of room to grow as well. He'll get bigger. He'll get stronger. But I just think Elijah has a little more ceiling to his game. Shout out Carrie Underwood. Shout out the uh, the fine, fine city of Chicago, Oklahoma. Last but not least, I thought, you know, it's one of those things, like I think we get, always get wrapped up into the um, kind of the doldrums, I guess, if you will, of the camp session. And, uh, you know, what do players actually kind of get out of it? I It brought a smile to my face watching back the interview uh, with Landon Rink because he was extremely excited about being invited to the Under Armour event uh, after a what sounds like a very good performance on Sunday. What can you tell us about the Cypress Scythe Fair defensive lineman and Oklahoma offer? Yeah, you know, and I'm with you, Eddie. Like, because you get so used to these guys, and I, and I, I get it. They go to these camps and they say, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm I've got offers from 60 schools. I should be invited to the All American game." Landon Rink's got Texas, a and you know, Oklahoma. Like, you run down the list. He's got a bunch of great offers, a bunch of great opportunities. But he was clearly very, very excited about being invited to play in the Under Armour game. You know, he talked about it in the interview. Like, I don't have to think about it. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to go play in that game. So, um, when and, you know, when you get in this era of guys that will get down there and then suddenly have an injury or something, oh, I've, I took the flight, but now my hamstring's hurting, like, Landon Rink's not going to pull that stuff. Like he's right. going to love every rep. He's going to piss off every offensive lineman that's down there because he will go a hundred miles an hour the whole time. Um, but yeah, watching him, this was my, I think only my second time to really watch Landon. I think the first time since he was maybe going into his sophomore year, he was really young. The last time I saw him, he's grown a little bit, um, very, you know, uh, very, technically advanced which doesn't surprise you his father played at texas is it you know is, is a coach there at sci fair um so there's a lot he's learned that other people haven't learned one of the things that we were talking about you, you know myself and a few of the other guys that were watching on hand he's one of the guys if i was going to pick out of all these defensive linemen that OU's involved with he's one of the guys that i would say he's part of the rotation next year i don't know what he's going to play i don't know what you're talking about he's going to get out there and he'll have a role. I'm not telling you he's ever going to be a superstar. He's not a guy that I would say, oh, let him play as a freshman. Then by his sophomore year, he's pushing for all American. But I would bet you three, four years, however long he's in the college game, he is a at least a rotational piece from day one. Like Because he is just so good. He's so sound. He'll do everything a coach asks him to do. And he knows why he's doing it, more importantly. Like, th there's an there's an idea behind everything Landon's doing. Josh, uh, Texas A&M leading that, that recruitment right now? That's that's my read. And, you know, he even – sometimes it's not telling, but, you know, kind of asked him, you know, the schools that were, uh, were kind of sticking out. And he said Texas A&M, Oklahoma. And then I can't really remember where he went from there, but – I thought it was interesting the order he mentioned them in because that's kind of my read on it is that, you know, if you were going to handicap it, I'd say 60-40 A&M over Oklahoma. I think outside of those two schools would probably be a pretty big surprise to most of us. And I know people will say, what about Texas? I asked him about it in the interview. You know, we, we talked about the thought of, you know, if I'd have told 10-year-old Landon Rink that he wasn't going to be playing at Texas, he was going to go to one of their two arch rivals. And he kind of said, ah, you know, I don't know what I would have thought about that, but you know, that's just where I have the relationships. That's where I feel good about. And I, I think Oklahoma has a chance here, but it does feel like maybe over the last couple of months as things have settled in and Mike Elko has gotten comfortable there at A&M, I think they've made a big run. And, you know, for those that aren't familiar, you know, Cy Fair is maybe an hour from college station. I mean, it's just a straight shot up two ninety, and you're out in, uh, out in the country and then you're headed up to, to A&M. So, 
I think that helps them a lot, and I do think they've made a big move. But Oklahoma's not out of the race. It's going to be interesting. Josh, we appreciate it. Uh, always good to kind of catch up, and especially here during this time of the year with everything that is going on as far as the Under Armour events, spring football for a lot of these high schools is going to start up and uh, ramp up here over the next couple weeks. So it's going to be certainly interesting to uh, kind of see everything unfold, and especially uh, with the quarterback uh, situation. I don't even know if it's a situation at Oklahoma uh, with uh, Kevin Sperry, and then, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to just keep – beating the uh, the Grady Adamson drum here over the next couple months should be uh, I'll stop at some point when I realize maybe it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, he, he or Ficklin again, I Oklahoma, have good if, options if things if were to go wrong, right. There are good options. And I, and I will tell you, Eddie, just speaking to some people, if, if something were to go wrong, I've, I feel like Ficklin would absolutely get a phone call like that. That's And, you know, and I'm not saying Adamson wouldn't yeah. as well, but, I think that is somebody they 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 think has some real potential and maybe fits what you know you and I were talking about at Under Armour that there's just no sense in those two guys not having more attention than they have. Don't make a lot of sense, Josh. We appreciate it, Giorgio. We appreciate it as you head off to uh, Las Vegas. Josh, you have any uh, advice for uh, George here as he embarks on a bachelor party to uh, Las Vegas? Uh, George, my bachelor party was in Las Vegas. Um, Where'd you stay? I, uh, we stayed at a place that no longer exists. Um, we, we you know, we, we went, uh, off, we went balling on a budget, but, um, it has been demolished since then. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, the, the prime example that I always give everybody midday, get yourself in a sports book, bet on a, some sort of basketball game. This weekend's perfect. Yeah. Bet on a basketball game and drink all the gray goose. They're going to let you drink until they cut you off and make you drink something, something cheap and well. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a blast. It'll be uh, about, we'll see how we'll see if I come back or not. A lot. Be, Las Vegas. We're gonna staying at the Flamingo. A drink and a half if it takes. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, drunk. We're at the Flamingo. Flamingo, solid. That, that yeah. that's a that's a level of where I stayed. So I, I can absolutely relate. We stayed at uh, what was it? the Westward Ho. That that used to be the name of it's this big white building. I want to say they demolished it maybe like a year later or something, and it was kind of like Asian themed. And so I I love sake, so you could just walk down like around the tables and get a bottle of sake. It was it was kind of great. Westward Ho is what they should have called Lincoln Riley when he left to go to Los Angeles. All righty, <laughs> that's gonna do it. Josh, we appreciate it. George, we appreciate it. We will see you right back here on the SuiterScoop.com YouTube channel next time.